Well, I bought myself a kit, a small kit for a variable power supply. Yes, indeed. Um, it might sound strange to you all that I would need something like a variable power supply, uh, but really, um, for certain projects, I do need a variable power supply and uh, not a very complicated one at that. So I bought a small power supply kit which uh, gives 0 to 15 volts DC, regulated of course. And it's, it has a, two nice features on it, which is that on the one hand it has obviously the power, the, the regulated variable power supply itself, which is built around a LM317, which I'm sure some of you will know. It's not a power transistor, it's more like a chip. And an integrated circuit uh, which is built into a TO22 housing and and it helps to regulate the voltage yeah and it's actually buried somewhere inside this little bag of goodies now um, I know this isn't really anything special but I just wanted to to share it with you Oh, and by the way, it has two more features, apparently. It has a uh, digital tester on it, too, meaning that um, it allows you to test either whether either a port on a logic chip is high or low, and it also has a continuity tester with an audible signal in other words a buzzer so well okay it's nothing special but it's just something for fun and if in the end it turns out useful well so much the better so actually the whole kit cost me something like a little bit less than fifteen dollars and with it I got a schematic I got a printed circuit board which you see here I got all the electronic parts you know uh, the active and passive parts so transistor uh, integrated circuits uh, resistors, capacitors, uh, potentiometer, you name it. And it also comes with a uh, cooling body for the power regulator, the LM317, around which the circuit is built. And a tiny little voltage meter which is actually a tiny little circuit on its own and its function is simply to display the voltage being output okay well the inventory is as you can see here um, nine resistors, four uh, classic diodes, so of the type 1N4007 or something like that, two Zener diodes, two four, four electrolytic capacitors, two ceramic cap capacitors, one NPN transistor, one 
CD4069 integrated circuit um, and this contains six inverter gates so what it means is that if you put a zero or a low on one side it comes out as a one or a high on the other side and vice versa so that's what this chip contains six of those inverting gates four LEDs one LM317 a potentiometer a buzzer a surface mounted potentiometer right here uh, an integrated circuit foot and then two uh, contact box one f with three pins one with two and then a button to be mounted on the potentiometer you see here then what we have is a small transformer a PCB yeah. quite nicely done too and then a whole bunch of loose parts which I will use to assemble a perspex box into which I will mount the whole circuitry and a cooling body for the LM317 power regulator and to top it off a tiny self-contained digital voltmeter going to 99.9 .9 volts uh, a few uh, wires black and red wires two crocodile clamps and an AC power cord I installed the resistors onto the PCB first and uh, well it's pretty easy the parts are marked with a, their values on the PCB so for example this capacitor is marked as 10 microfarads so it's really easy to to find the right part to put onto the PCB so I read the value of the resistor and then put the right type resistor in place and then I bent the resistor legs outward and now I'm going to solder them into place and that's done with uh, soldering iron obviously and a little solder so the way I do it is I heat up a tiny little bit of solder on the tip first to get some flux on it and then I heat up a little drop of solder and let it flow onto the PCB island, soldering island. So. Yeah, and I heat it just long enough to make the solder flow around the leads of the resistor so that's what I'm going to do now I'm going to solder all of them and I'm going to do the same thing with the capacitors I'm done soldering the capacitors resistors and diodes I couldn't actually resist doing the diodes too so there you go the two Zener diodes here and the four uh, bridge rectifier diodes uh, it's a, a classical bridge rectifier setup uh, built around four diodes it's the cheap way to go but it'll work as well as a true bridge 
uh, integrated circuit rectifier. Okay, so I'm getting prepared to solder the integrated circuit's foot. And as you can see, um, I need to keep it flush with the PCB. And the way I do that is by using a crocodile clamp and clamping it to the PCB until, until I solder the parts or I should say until I solder a few legs of the IC uh, holder. So once I solder say the four corner legs of the IC foot then I can release the crocodile clamp and solder all the other foot of the IC holder to solder up the LM317 power regulator as you can see now there is a an annoying detail that is that the screw which you see which and, and, and the nut which are holding the LM317 to its cooling body which was supplied um, well that screw was missing so no matter how many times I counted the number of screws supplied with the kit I just couldn't find any screw which was supposed to be used with the LM317 so I just supplied a screw of my own which happens to be an M2 screw. So I used a, a stainless steel M2 screw and nut to bolt the LM317 to its cooling body. And uh, the reason why I did that is because, you see, I need to mount the cooling body with the LM317 onto the PCB. Had I mounted, had I mounted the cooling body first and the transistor next, or vice versa, first the transistor and then the cooling body, it would have been way too hard to make the holes of both coincide. So what I did instead is I bolted the LM317 to its final cooling body and therefore to its final position and that way I get the distance for both and the centering for both just right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to solder the LM317 to the PCB and the cooling body because it, all, it too has pins, these pins here, yeah. So, <coughs> excuse me, so yes, I'm going to solder that up to the PCB too. Now, I've got a similar kind of problem with the potentiometer. Now, as you, as you can see on the PCB, there are, if you look carefully, there are two rows of holes here where I hold my finger. You see there are two rows of holes. And you can mount the potentiometer in one set of, of holes, the lower ones, like this. Or you can mount it in the higher set of holes, like that. 
Now, the thing is, I'm not going to solder up the potentiometer to the PCB until I know the exact positioning of the PCB inside its final case. Because that way I can judge which row of holes you see here uh, will fit the right position. So I'm going to hold off with that. I'm also going to hold off with mounting the tiny little power meter or power display uh, just because I want to see what type of position for the meter for the gauge the volt gauge is is the right one yeah, because I don't I, I not only want to make it a practical useful thing um, if uh, possible I also want to make it well aesthetic uh, I should say aesthetically pleasing okay so I mounted the LEDs I let's let me zoom out I mounted the LEDs here uh, their colors are marked on the PCB so uh, well you, you can see the colors for yourselves the clear LED on your left is a blue one okay so I already mounted the chip and the buzzer and the NPN transistor which was supplied with the whole thing so we're nearing the completion of the PCB now that the PCB is well let's say as good as ready um, I'm going to stop temporarily continuing work on the PCB and I'm going to well analyze if that's the word to use how the box is constructed now the perspex or plexiglass box that is supplied with the power supply you see here is made out of different parts now the thing is um, I first need to have a look at how it's constructed so that I can assemble it and put the PCB into it yeah and more precisely I need the placement uh, the space or rather the exact position of the PCB within uh, the box to judge where I should uh, place the potentiometer which will help to choose the right output voltage okay so um, the box as you can see is supplied as a, a, a whole collection of parts uh, and a whole lot of these tiny little screws and nuts um, in fact I even have more of those uh, screws and nuts here now it's also supplied with spacers that uh, lift the PCB from the bottom plate of the box now as you can see the PCB has four holes in its uh, one in each corner now logically speaking that would make this the ground plate and if you put both on top of each other you see that the holes the holes in in the PCB and the ground plate coincide completely so that's a good start okay now so from that logically follows that this is probably the top plate so which goes on top like this and then this one 
is probably the front plate because you can see the hole here which has been cut to house the potentiometer. Well, knowing these three things, well, assembly of the whole box becomes rather simple. So, we put the front plate onto the base plate, like this. So, like this. Okay. Then we put an I almost identical plate onto the back, like this. You see? So we're we're getting we're getting there. So then these plates, these short ones, are most probably uh, the side plates. Yeah. Now you can see that this one has an, an oval opening cut that probably coincides with these connectors on the PCB, these blue ones here. So, in fact, like this, yeah. you, I think you can see it, okay? So, this is the, assuming that we will place the PCB in this direction into the box, this is the right plate, so there we go. Okay, and now this plate has a hole cut, which I suspect is a hole for the AC wire. Now, whether I place it like this or like this, technically speaking, yeah, in this direction or that direction, technically speaking, doesn't really make any kind of difference. But since we always want the AC wire as far away from the front of the uh, case of the supply, we'll turn it this way. Okay, here we go. And there you go. The fully assembled case of the power supply. Yeah. So, from all sides, this is the underside, yeah, okay, so, what I'm going to do now is place the PCB inside and have a look where I should place the potentiometer, uh -huh. now, Immediately, I see something that I need to change. Now, the potentiometer, as you can see, has a little, and I'll give you more light, the potentiometer has a little tab on its top side. Yeah? And the tab should fit inside this opening here next right next to the opening where the potentiometer uh, shaft will exit the box so if you take a look at the potentiometer you'll see immediately that I shouldn't hold it this way but that way okay so let's insert the potentiometer into it and let's screw it temporarily at least to the front of the case. Hang on. Hang on, hang on. There you go. So I screwed it to the front of the plate. Okay. So now let's have a look where in which holes the potentiometer should be fitted and immediately I see we have a little problem yes uh, hang on I'm trying to figure out yeah 
we have a little problem. If if I place the PCB inside of the box and you see the PCB there, yeah, and you see these connectors here should go into the PCB. But if you look carefully, you'll see that the PCB and the potentiometer are misaligned yeah now even if I reverse the thing well if I reverse the thing it is aligned but then we have a lot of problem which is that the hole the hole for the tab on the potentiometer is on the wrong side and that is a problem that is a problem okay so uh, hmm yes that is a problem uh, mm -mm. okay so, either I mount the potentiometer like this, so with its pins to the top of the box, and then uh, mount wires down to the PCB to connect it up, or I take away the tab on top of the potentiometer and attach it to the front of the case, but without a tab. Now that is a very good question. What am I going to do? Uh, that is a bit of a problem. Hmm. Or I mount it like this and then I mount a few little wires going to the potentiometer okay well that is a bit of a problem okay but now it really becomes academic uh, how to place the potentiometer inside the case of the power supply since um, the hole for the tab is uh, well is not in its correct spot I'd rather not damage the front plate of of the power supply yeah so because technically speaking I could drill a tiny little hole on the other side to fit the tab on the potentiometer but I don't want to damage the, the front of the case so no uh, I'm not going to drill an extra hole for the tab so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount the uh, potentiometer onto the front of the case and um, and well yeah uh, then I'll, I'll solder a, f uh, a few wires from the potentiometers uh, uh, tabs uh, to the uh, holes on the PCB for the potentiometer. Okay, well, that sort of takes care of that problem. So now the next problem is now that we figured out how we're going to place everything inside the uh, inside the, the, the case of the power supply let's mount the power supply okay before I can do that I need to mount the transformer onto the PCB first um, now the problem is um, I could do that but I need to figure out which end is the 
12 volt uh, output of the transformer and which is the AC input. Now I measured the I measured the poles of, of, of the transformer or, or rather the, the, the windings of the transformer and one winding uh, has a, a lower uh, resistance than the other which seems to suggest that uh, you know the windings with the most resistance are the AC uh, side of the of the transformer and the one with the lowest amount of winding so the lowest resistance is the AC output so let's see uh, let's measure, okay? So, I'm going to show you. Okay, now I'm measuring the resistance on the blue wires. Yeah. And the resistance is. The resistance is. Eleven point four ohms. Yeah, I'm on the lowest scale on my meter, as you can see. I'm on the lowest scale, uh, and um, the meter reads out eleven point four ohms. Okay, so now let's measure the other winding. Now, let's see the scale. Okay, I'm on the 20k scale of my meter, and it reads out that the resistance is. Um, 3.03 .03 kilo ohms. So, in other words, that's uh, 3,030 ohms. Okay. Um, I would tend to say that uh, my reasoning is correct. However, just to be on the safe side, I'm going to connect my uh, transformer onto my variac and I'm going to put a low voltage through my variac yeah so that uh, I can measure the output of it with my multimeter and just uh, see whether I get a downward uh, transforming of the voltage or an upward if the voltage on the blue wires, on the blue winding, is lower than the voltage that I put onto the red windings, then I know it's my interpretation was correct. If uh, it's the reverse, that uh, the input voltage is lower than the output voltage, then I know I've got the wires uh, switched around. So, let's have a go. Okay. Okay, I'm turning my variac down to zero. Okay. Whenever you work with raw AC power, even if it's through Variac or, or an isolation transformer or whatever, be aware that it is uh, regarded as high voltage, yeah? And it's possibly lethal. So always take precautions when you work with that kind of voltage. So 
always be aware where your hands are or your body is um, in in uh, relative to the uh, circuitry you're going to test because um, well uh, most of the time with high voltage you only get one chance to get it right if you get it wrong you die so uh, okay now let's see I'm setting my meter on AC volt okay now I need two more crocodile clamps. Okie dokie. There you go. Okay. Now let's connect it all up to the secondary. Now the reason why I'm cautioning you with, with the transformer measurement I'm going to do is this. Suppose I, I got it wrong and in fact I'm inputting AC, raw AC power into the secondary of the transformer and I'm measuring on, this, on the primary. Um, you will get let's see now uh, a roughly a multiplication of voltage by 20 yeah which means that if I input uh, say 10 volts into the secondary of this transformer and I measure on the primary I should get around 200 volts AC so be really careful okay so uh, here we go. Okay. So I'm measuring the the secondary voltage. I think you can see the meter. Okay. Well, I think we're all set. So let's see if I got it right. Or wrong. Oh. oh yeah, I got it right. Okay, well, I peeled off the protective layer from the perspex base of the power supply case and I attached the four standoffs that were supplied with it so uh, little brass standoffs with uh, nuts on the other side um, there were no washers supplied so I assume that without the washers this will work just as well. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is mount the... Uh, oh yeah, I, I also mounted the transformer onto the PCB as you can see. I also used uh, a couple of screws that were supplied uh, together with their nut. So, and um, it's a perfect fit, I would say. So I centered the transformer on the PCB. So, uh, okay, let's have a look whether it will fit onto the base plate. Okay. Now I have a couple of screws here that I want to try out. Okay, hang on. Okay, that's the first one. There you go. Okay, so I should stress the point that no washers were supplied. So I assume that all the materials that I'm screwing together 
uh, are meant to be screwed together without washers. Um, I suppose if you are going to assemble something similar, well, maybe you should consider using washers uh, to protect the PCB surface or something like that. But, okay, um, I assume it won't be any problem. So I'm almost done. Okay. Now, the reason why I do not assemble the whole electronic part first and then only then the uh, cabinet of uh, the power supply is because um, I always uh, start from the assumption that there might, even if it's milled to precise specifications, um, there could always be something not fitting right or something needing a little bit of adjustment. So, um, I prefer to test it first, just to be on the safe side, before I start finishing assembling the PCB. So, okay, it's a little more work, but then at least I know that if I'm going to solder on any more parts to the PCB, they will fit. So, okay, here we go. As you can see, it's mounted. The PCB is mounted to the purse pack back, or I should say underside of the cabinet. So, yeah, well, okay. Yeah, I didn't clean off the PCB yet. But I am going to, once I'm done with soldering. Okay, so uh, it looks okay. So now let's see if we assemble the box temporarily. Everything will fit. Oh, by the way, Perspex is a kind of polymer. Do not, I repeat, do never use uh, petrol or... Uh, acetone on it ever because if you do you're going to damage the surface of the perspex okay so don't do that okay so just use a little water and a little bit of detergent and that will work just as well but uh, by the way alcohol is also a no-no you know because polymers are uh, soluble in any kind of organic compound, you know, like petrol or alcohol or or acetone. So, if you're going to use any type of solvents on it, then you should use uh, something which has a, a, a non carbon type of, of solvent you know like like soap for example soap and, and certainly water okay I'm almost there hang on yep okay so there we go so as you can see it's mounted inside of its case and I'm trying to see whether it's bumping into anything or or if there's friction somewhere and no, there isn't. The only, well, the only thing that is a little bit annoying is that the tabs which hold the, the transformer to the PCB are slightly longer, or, or sticking out, I should say, from the PCB, and they are hitting the case a just, but only just. So... Um, I think that won't pose any kind of problem. So yeah, I think it's a perfect fit. Uh, even from the sides, as you can see, the connectors are visible. Yeah, and then uh, I'm also going to mount the AC wire here. And as you can see, uh, the AC wires will have a clear part to the inside of the cabinet. So yeah, I think 
the PCB mounting the PCB in the end onto the cabinet uh, won't pose any kind of problem. Now there's one more thing I want to check. Normally the PCB is meant to house the little voltmeter that was supplied with it uh, in the center of the PCB. And I'm going to check whether that's exactly what I want or not. So if I put the little voltmeter that was supplied with it, the digital voltmeter, it should go right in the center of the PCB like this. Okay, I'm going to take down one side so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so it's meant to be mounted on the center like this. So, and I, I suppose that if it's mounted there, there, I can I can look at it from an angle, and it might even work out. Yeah, yeah, it might even work out. Okay, so yeah, I'll I'll stick to the plan and mount the voltmeter, mount the voltmeter where it was intended to be mounted there. Now I have a little bit of luck in the sense that as you can see the voltmeter uh, needs to be connected with three wires and you remember that I need to connect up the uh, potentiometer but in such a way that it's not aligning with the holes for, for it on the PCB. So. I don't need this much cable for the voltmeter, so I'm going to cut an end of it and connect it up to the potentiometer and then in the end connect it up to the PCB. And that's the plan. Well, and here is the result of all my work. Um, you'll notice that I hooked it up to the AC. Uh, but you'll also notice I did make two um, alterations to the setup. First of all, um, you'll notice the fuse holder. I still don't understand why people persist in designing uh, AC powered devices like this one and uh, not including any type of fuse. I mean, that's ridiculous, okay? So if you're going to make something which is AC powered, um, then at least include a fuse. Okay, there wasn't any on-off switch uh, built into it. And uh, I am going to wait with building in an on-off uh, switch. Why? Well, because you see this opening in the Perspex, yeah? Um, normally this opening is used for the trimmer, you see down there. But once I aligned the circuitry, I'm going to use this opening for a switch, an on-off switch. Granted, uh, it'll look a little bit strange on top of the box, but, uh, well, you know, I thought that having such a uh, AC powered voltage regulator, it would be, well, it would be smarter to have an on off switch than none. So I guess, you know, the fuse holder and, uh, and no off switch included in this uh, device well the reason for it was to save money uh, because uh, once again I need to tell you this was not expensive this was about $15 so yeah um, I'm not entirely happy with the design also um, as a kind of a test I gave a slant to the voltmeter, the digital voltmeter. Now, even with the slant, um, 
because of a badly designed potentiometer location, um, well, it sort of blocks the sight of the voltmeter. Anyhow, um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, this was, uh, I just built this for fun and of course for use, but you know, I'm not going to look onto the voltmeter all the time. So it doesn't really matter uh, that it's badly located. Okay, so what am I going to do now? Well, I'm going to power it up and see whether it works at all and then see, uh, measure the output voltage and see if the voltmeter readout and the real measured output voltage coincide. Um, I turned up the variac to maximum uh, rather quickly because, um, well, I just wanted to show you how the circuitry looks when it works. Now, it turns out the voltmeter, which you see down there, but which probably is difficult to read, uh, does follow the measurements on my voltmeter. So the little voltmeter on the circuit and measuring the output of the power supply um, do measure the same voltage. So that part of the circuitry uh, is okay. Now, um, as far as I can understand the schematic, which is this one. Yeah. Um, as you can see, uh, the explanation is written in Chinese. So unfortunately, uh, I have no clue as to what it all means. Um, I mean, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of explanation. But and there's something written here like R1, 180, and then 200. So I suppose they mean that R1 should be should have a value between 180 and 200. Although, like I said, I I don't read Chinese, so I don't know whether that's precisely what it means. Now, um, as to the other circuitry, well. There seems to be a logic tester on the board too, uh, as far as I understand. And um, one is a signal generator, which is this. So this generates a low frequency signal. Uh, and I think you can set the frequency of the generator of the low frequency generator with the potentiometer, the surface mounted potentiometer down there on the circuit. So I haven't tested that out yet. Then there's another part of the circuit which you can use as a logical uh, zero or one output uh, measurement. So remember the chip contains three uh, in inverters yeah so they use three inverters to produce a logic tester which is this one with which you can theoretically measure the output of a digital chip yeah to see whether the output is low or high this one uh, generates a low frequency sound with the help of the other three inverting latches or amplifiers, if you wish, or gates in the chip. So, yeah. Then there is a kind of a continuity buzzer on the circuit, and that allows you to uh, measure continuity of a circuit. Uh, I haven't tested that out yet either. So the three lowest circuits I haven't tested out yet. Now, 
Um, I think the uh, blinking green and red LED uh, show the uh, either show the frequency of uh, the low frequency generator or it might be the yellow one I don't know let me see okay so the yellow one the blinking one this one here shows the frequency of the low frequency uh, generator so let's see if we can make it go faster yes we can Okay, well, this is a low frequency. I think it would be, oh, I don't know, uh, about 30 hertz. So let's see if I can make it go faster. Yep. So now it's probably somewhere in the 300 hertz region. Uh, it's not very stable, though. Okay, let's see. Okay. So there you go. So the output frequency should be around, I guess, 300 hertz. But we would have to measure it with the oscilloscope to be certain. Okay, now as to the green and the red. Uh, LEDs, I think they are used to show a logical zero or a logical one. Now I'd have to read the circuitry, let's see. So, let's see what the green one says, okay? So, the input is here. Say the input is high. So high goes into the first inverter, goes low, low goes here, so high comes out here. This LED will be off, the green one, and the red one will be burning, yeah? So because there will be, if there's one here, there will be a one here because these two inverters negate each other. So the output of this gate is the same one as the input of this gate. Now let's see what happens here. One becomes zero. So this becomes a virtual ground. So which means that there will be negative potentials sort of on the cathode of the red LED and there will be a positive voltage on the anode of the red LED. So a 1 on the input will produce a 1 here and will make the red LED uh, light up. Now suppose there is a 0 or a ground signal on the input. So 0 becomes 1. 1 becomes zero. So this becomes a virtual ground. Zero goes into this inverter, becomes one. So there will be a, a plus or, or, or a power supply voltage on, or a, 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 let's say five volt output here. And there will be a virtual ground here. So the green LED will burn. In other words, a zero will make the green LED burn, uh, uh, light up. A one will make the red one light up. Now there's nothing connected to the input, the measurement input. Yeah. So um, I guess. Uh, depending on the on uh, well on, on, on any sort of influence from the outside 
um, when you power up the power supply it will either be green or red uh, possibly both but I don't think so so um, actually what I uh, should do is if I don't use the logic probe which is built onto the circuit board then I should connect the input the measurement input to ground with a resistor or something like that okay so to recapitulate the green and the red one show a logical one or a logical zero the yellow LED shows the frequency of the signal injector yeah and blue LED um, is just a kind of an on off LED um, it, it, it lights up brightly if the power circuit gives out full power and uh, it burns or lights up weakly if the voltage that is being output is low now unfortunately uh, because of the the way the circuitry is designed when the power drops below say roughly 5 volts DC the voltmeter suddenly switches off and so do most if not all the LEDs except perhaps for the blue one but that lights up very weakly now there is one problem though so I uh, connected everything up according to the schematic but um, you'll notice that I hooked up a uh, 180 ohms resistor here now I did that because when I didn't the potentiometer was starting to uh, warm up to heat up so much so that it started to smoke so um, it that means that it was drawing way much too much current so what I did was actually I doubled the resistance uh, between uh, this pin and hang on yeah this pin of the potentiometer and uh, this one so be in fact between here you should imagine an extra resistor of 180 ohms now as it turns out um, that did cut the amount of current running through the potentiometer so now it doesn't heat up anymore but the trouble is that doing that also reduced the amount of uh, power uh, output power I can uh, set so now it's set at the minimum and uh, which is let me show you on the meter 12.5 let's say yeah and if I turn it up completely so if I turn it like this all the way to the other side then it uh, gives almost 14 volts okay so with 180 ohms that I installed uh, between the potentiometer and between the potentiometer and the uh, pin 1 the voltage adjustment pin to the LM317 I did manage to reduce the current to a more manageable level for the potentiometer but 180 ohms apparently is still a bit too much so, so uh, I'll have to tweak this resistor so that I can regulate the voltage the output voltage between say 5 volts 
and a maximum of 14. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to tweak the voltage, uh, the resistance of this resistor so that I can choose or set the power supply between roughly 5 volts DC and 14 volts DC, which would be nice. Of course, it would be nicer if I could go all the way down to roughly 2 volts, let's say, but then the whole circuitry becomes unstable. And uh, since uh, uh, I think for the stability of the circuitry it would be better to output enough voltage uh, I think 5 volts at the lowest uh, would be well preferable I temporarily succeeded in uh, fixing it or I should say I succeeded in fixing it temporarily um, because it turns out that there was a, a tiny flaw in the design of the power supply and uh, the potentiometer that was uh, supplied with it was um, well wasn't too good so like I said uh, a few minutes ago uh, or I actually I should say a few hours ago um, is that um, they did omit a 180 ohms resistor um, in the connection between the wiper of the potentiometer and the pin one, if I'm not mistaken, of the reference voltage pin of the LM317. So I did that, I modified it, and you can see the little resistor over there. Um, let me take my pointer. So I added that little resistor over there. So uh, now it works uh, quite well and I'll show you oh yeah I added a on off switch as you can see yeah this tumble switch and I added the fuse but that you already knew so yeah now you could say the power supply is complete and as you can see the voltage uh, that is on the tiny little voltmeter down there in uh, in the case well let me switch the lights out there you can see it now so the voltage which you see there is uh, the same voltage you see on my multimeter uh, well give or take 5 millivolts uh, so it's reasonably accurate if you take into account the fact that it's a quite simple power supply and um, I can vary the output of DC power by turning the the little potentiometer see and I can turn it up all the way up to almost 13 volts there you go so yeah it works um, and I can go all the way down to well let's say two and a half volts um, so yeah, uh, the power supply works. Um, I still haven't had the opportunity to test out the uh, audio frequency generator and the logic tester, but I'm sure I'll come around to do that one of these days. So um, that's it guys, the construction 
of a small variable regulated power supply. I hope you enjoyed it. So good night and I'll see you around. Bye bye.